Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your phones. I hope you'll join us next week when Frank Figures will present Stories and Secrets, A History of the M.W. Stringer Grand Lodge. Up, oh, can't hear it? All right. I'm up in the auditorium. I bet they'll turn it up for us. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. William E. Cochran to discuss the history of optometry in Mississippi. The Kosciuszko native completed his pre-optometry requirements at the University of Southern Mississippi, then earned his BS and Doctor of Optometry from Southern College of Optometry in Memphis. Cochran served in the U.S. Army Medical Service Corps from 1968 to 1970, then operated a private practice in Kosciuszko from 1970 to 1983. He served as president of Southern College of Optometry from 1984 to 2007 and is the author of the book Optometry in Mississippi, 1920 to 2020. Dr. Dr. Cochran was inducted into the American Optometric Association's National Hall of Fame in 2012. Help me welcome Dr. William E. Cochran. Thanks, Chris. Make sure my microphone's working. Thank you, Chris, for that kind introduction and inviting me to this session of Lunch's History. And I see people are, are enjoying their lunch, and uh, I'll probably join you afterwards. It's been a long time since breakfast. It's indeed a pleasure to be with you this afternoon to share a little history of the profession of optometry in Mississippi. I was quite surprised by a phone call I received in the summer of 2018 from Linda Aldi, sitting here, the executive director of the Mississippi Optometric Association. Linda reminded me that the year 2020 would be the 100th anniversary of the Mississippi Optometric Association. She went on to ask if I would be willing to write a history of optometry in Mississippi as part of the celebration of the founding of the association. After I stuttered a bit and said, you know, Linda, I've been in Memphis for 35 years. Why me? She responded, yes, but you're the only one we know that can go back to, 19, to the 1920 beginning. <laughs> to which I promptly replied, hell, I'm not that old. But those of you who know Linda Aldi know that she's not easily deterred. She talked about my grandfather being licensed in 1920 and that my mom and dad were career members of the association with me growing up to be a member and serving as president. I finally agreed that I would think about it. And now here we are with a little book that hopefully captures 100 years of history of optometry that parallels the evolution of health care in Mississippi. I think Mrs. Lacey, my seventh grade Mississippi history teacher, has probably rolled over in her grave. As I mentioned, Linda Aldi, the just recently retired executive director of the association, and Sarah Link, wherever Sarah is now, oh, right there, the current executive directors deserve the credit and thanks for coming up with the idea to tell the story of a century of optometry in Mississippi, and I'm very thankful for their ongoing support and encouragement. The book is intended to document a century of professional growth and development and to reflect the commitment of the men and women calling themselves optometrists to the health and visual welfare of the citizens of Mississippi. To set the stage for this presentation, we need to go back in time just a bit. With the discovery of glass in 3000 BC, there came a realization of its potential to reflect and refract or bend light. During the third century BC, Ptolemy proposed a theory that rays of light somehow emanated from the eye. I guess like a 
a, you know, a movie with the rays coming out of somebody's eye. In the 13th century, modern optical theory was advanced by scientists Isaac Newton and Robert Hooke. About the same time, philosopher Roger Bacon was able to demonstrate that light reflects from objects rather than by being released by them. The first wearable eyeglasses were invented in Italy around 1286 as part of the optical industry of grinding and polishing lenses for spectacles. Spectacle makers created improved types of lenses for the correction of vision based more on knowledge gained from trial and error. You know that part of the eye exam where the doctor says which is better, one or two? Well, that reminds me of my favorite optometry joke. It seems there was a man on his deathbed that was asked by the family, what is your last wish? Do you want the priest? No, he said, I want my optometrist. Dumbfounded, the family called in the optometrist, in which the dying man called him over, grabbed him by the tie, pulled him down close to the bed and said, I just have to know which is better, one or two. <laughs> no more jokes. Now back to the early history. In the 17th century, Johann Kepler, a German astronomer, was able to correctly deduce the role of the retina as the actual organ that records images. In the modern day, we learn that the nerves of the retina send messages to the eye by way of the optic nerve to the brain which actually interprets what we see. We call that vision. Throughout history, mankind has recognized the limits of human eyesight, be it an inherited anomaly, an occupational hazard, the aging process, most of us, some of us know about that, injury or disease. By the late 1800s, as the skill in measuring the powers of human eyesight slowly developed, those individuals providing such services were for the most part engaged in other businesses. Many were jewelers. They did not call themselves optometrists, but refracting opticians. However, the word optometry was used when ref referring to the determination of refractive errors, like farsightedness and nearsightedness. As early as 1895, an article in an optometric journal called for the formation of a national organization to advance the science of opt optics and to promote the practice of optometry. Also, due to the growing opposition of medicine, a national organization was needed to lead a disciplined approach to enact legislation regulating the practice of optometry. Three years later, in 1898, 83 charter members representing 31 states met in New York to establish what was to become the American Optometric Association. In 1901, Minnesota became the very first state to pass a law regulating the practice of optometry. North Dakota and California soon followed in 1903. At the 1905 annual national convention in Minneapolis, with 1,232 members attending, sample legislature bills were recommended to state associations seeking to regulate the practice of optometry. The leaders of the profession understood the necessity of ensuring that the public was receiving quality eye and vision care. By 1909, 24 states had passed laws regulating the practice, creating 24 state boards of examiners. These boards were charged with enforcing the state laws, giving licensing examinations, and issuing licenses. But there was a need for continuity across the nation. At the 1909 National Convention in Atlanta, a group of state board members met to deal with the licensing issues facing the young profession. As a result, the National Board of State Examiners in Optometry was formed. Its purpose was to cooperate in unifying the examinations and provisions of state laws. 
Today's graduates of optometry school must pass all three parts of the national board examinations to be licensed in any state. Now, just like the other healthcare professions, the existing educational programs at, in the early times required strict standards. During the 1915 annual meeting, the national board made specific recommendations for educational standards. Now, I want you to hear this. One, 75% be the minimum standard of the written work on examinations. The standard of clinical work be raised as high as practical. Three, all states require two years of high school prior to attending optometry school. Four, the textbook of the association be used. And five, the matter of reciprocity or being able to change your license or move from one state to another to practice, to be studied. Now, in those early times at that time, there were only a handful of what was considered reputable schools of optometry. In 1872, George McFatridge founded a school in Chicago teaching refraction. The Massachusetts College of Optometry was established in 1894. And no, I didn't go to school there. In 1904, now this is interesting, M.B. Ketchum, M.D., founded the Los Angeles School of Ophthalmology and Optometry. Columbia University in New York became the first university to establish a standalone program in optometry in 1910. In 1914, the Ohio State, I learned from my Ohio State friends, the Ohio State University established a course in applied optics later leading to a program in optometry. Now, by 1919, 46 states had passed laws regulating the practice of optometry. In March 1920, Mississippi became the 47th state to do so. As early as 1906, however, those calling themselves optometrists had formed the Mississippi Optical Society. The Mississippi Optical Journal reported in its November the 1st 1906 issue, and I quote, and you'll, those of you from Jackson will like this, this new society held a fall gathering at Edwards House, Jackson, in October last. The meeting was spent discussing matters pertaining to the benefit of the influential organization. Among regulations passed were the following, which will be of interest to the people of the state. Resolved that all applicants for admission to this society be examined upon the following subjects. The anatomy of the eye, refraction, optics, and practical experience. In 1909, the society changed its name to the Mississippi Association of Optometrists. Eleven years later, as I said, in 1920, the Mississippi legislature passed the Optometry Practice Act, making Mississippi the 47th state to enact an optometry law. License number one was issued to Dr. G.S. Sturm of Hazelhurst. Over the next several days, 137 optometrists, and basically anybody that said they were an optometrist, because they all helped get the law passed, and the legislature didn't limit uh, education or whatever, um, 137 were licensed. Now, my grandfather, Dr. Jim Edgar, from Hattiesburg, was issued license number 46. Now, this is interesting. The licensing fee at that time was $2. Today, the annual, annual licensing fee, I believe, is about $300. To put that original licensing fee in perspective, in the early 20s, 1920s, a Ford Model T cost $290, a typical house $4,500, a dozen eggs 34 cents, and a quart of milk 9 cents. At this point in time, my family history intersects with the story of optometry in Mississippi. 
As I mentioned, my maternal grandfather, Dr. James Edgar from Sharp County, Arkansas, had studied horology, and that's not a dirty word, which is watchmaking. He had studied watchmaking in, Los, in uh, St. Louis and then graduated from the Needles Institute of Optometry in Kansas City in 1916. He migrated to South Mississippi and Hattiesburg in 1919 and established a jewelry store and an optometric practice. In 1929, his building on Main Street in Hattiesburg caught fire and burned to the ground. As you will recall, this was the beginning of the Great Depression and his insurance company had declared bankruptcy. Without insurance to rebuild the building and continue operation of the jewelry store, grandfather returned to, or turned to the full-time practice of optometry. I often wondered if he was able to find some of those diamonds, uh, hopefully, from the fire, because I don't think they would burn. So hopefully somebody didn't get in and get them before he got them. So anyway, throughout the Depression, the Edgar family was fortunate to make ends meet there in Hattiesburg. Grandfather had 25 acres on which to raise cows, chickens, and grow a garden. The home and acreages were located on 25th Avenue, where the current University of Southern Mississippi women's softball field is located. The 1940s were, of course, consumed with World War II. After the war, veterans became eligible for financial and educational benefits as a result of the GI Bill of Rights. Veterans who had never even thought of a college education were now able to pursue a degree. As a result, there was an unprecedented increase in college attendance throughout the nation. Many enrolled in medicine, nursing, dentistry, and optometry. My dad, Nash Cochran, from Fort Myers, Florida, entered Southern College of Optometry in Memphis in the fall of 1941, where he met my mother, Nell Edgar, also a student. With the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 1941, my dad, along with most of the SCO students, joined the military. After a year of service, the Army released Dad to finish optometry school. Nash and Nell, by, by the way, was the third female to graduate from Southern College of Optometry, married soon after graduation. I came along in late 1945, thereby entering the world of optometry, and so far, after 75, 76 years, has so far, it's been an incredible journey. In January 1950, to combat commercial practice, those optometrists working for corporations as, and on, on a salary, and blatant advertising by some optometrists, the Mississippi Optometric Association passed a resolution adopting a code of ethics that barred non-professional optometrists from becoming members. There was no definition of non-professional. To get an idea of the commercial issue, the American Optometric Association stated in the November 1950 Red Book magazine, members of the American Optometric Association are pledged to conduct their practices along purely professional lines. Unfortunately, they have no jurisdiction over the neon lights and blatant advertising of quickie eyeglass parlors. I was told as a young kid, I didn't remember, but down Capitol Street, there were several offices on, on fronting Capitol Street with blinking lights and big eyeballs that blinked. And so it was, uh, it was a free-for-all. Through legal action, going all the way to the Mississippi Supreme Court, the Mississippi Association eventually prevailed against those that were engaged in what was considered the unlawful practice of optometry, advertising and working for commercial organizations. In the late 1950s, my mother, who was at the time the only female practitioner in the state, she chaired the ethics committee of the association. I remember she had to reprimand a member of the association for giving out pencils 
with the doctor's name and address imprinted on it. You have to understand in, in the professions, advertising of any kind by healthcare professionals as well as attorneys was verboten. The first African American to be licensed in Mississippi, Dr. David White from Jackson, took and passed the board exam at the Woolfolk State Office Building on July the 9th, 1951. He remained the only African American optometrist in the state until 1978, when Dr. Linda Johnson was licensed. And let me brag a little bit about Dr. Johnson. She has practiced at optometry at the Jackson Hines Comprehensive Health Center for 42 years, served as president of the State Association in 2003-2004, and in 2009 was named the American Optometric Association's Optometrist of the Year. She also served on the board and was chair of the Board of Trustees of Southern College of Optometry. Throughout the 1950s, the profession responded to the issues of continuing education, Medicare parity, challenges by ophthalmology, and established the public relations programs promoting the importance of eye care. Now, my earliest collection of, of optometry or organized optometry came from going with my parents, grandfather, and an uncle while they were attending educational and business meetings of the state association. During those childhood years, the meetings were usually held in Jackson at the Heidelberg Hotel on Capitol Street. Some of you may remember that Primo's restaurant was located just up the street where we got the best chocolate brownies with that sugar on the bottom in the famous purple box. I still get them when I'm in the area and probably will stop this afternoon on the way back to Memphis. In my teenage and college years, the annual convention of the Optometry Association was usually held on the coast. I didn't say the Mississippi coast, I said the coast, so y'all know where that is. The beach and wonderful seafood made the coast a great venue for convention for many different organizations. As late as the 1960s, Mississippi had not yet repealed the National Prohibition Act of 1919. Indeed, Mississippi was the last state to do so. Yet on the, on the coast, and in many parts of the state, liquor stores abounded. I pass this along because imbibing alcohol in hospitality rooms at conventions of all kinds was part and parcel of such meetings. While in college and working one summer in Jackson at one of the optical laboratories that sponsored a hospitality room at the summer convention, I was assigned the bartending duties. Of course, I only mixed and served drinks. In 1964, state, the State Board of Optometry passed a regulation requiring 24 hours of annual postgraduate optometric study as a prerequisite for license renewal. With that requirement, the annual continuing education meeting was usually held at Ole Miss and registered the largest attendance ever. In 1966, Governor Paul Johnson appointed an optometrist to the Mississippi State Board of Health. The MOA hired its first executive director in 1973. Three years later, Helen St. Clair was named as its second executive director. Ms. St. Clair's 29 years of service had a significant impact upon the progress of the profession and upon the quality of vision and health care available to the citizens of Mississippi. For that reason, the book Optometry in Mississippi 1920 to 2020 is dedicated to her memory. In 1974, Legislation was introduced to expand the scope of practice of optometry. At that time, the Practice Act limited optometrists to prescribing eyeglasses, contact lenses, and vision therapy. However, the Mississippi law was not keeping up with the current education and training 
of those graduating with the Doctor of Optometry degree, nor with the changing optometry laws throughout the nation. Unfortunately, at that time, Mississippi led the nation in blindness, mostly preventable diseases from the effects of diabetes and glaucoma. The proposed legislation would allow optometrists that were certified to use drugs to dilate the pupil in order to more accurately detect ocular disease and to observe the damaging effects of diabetes. Also, the legislation would allow the use of drugs to numb the cornea for more accurate intraocular pressure tests for glaucoma. It would take eight years of dedicated advocacy, educating the legislature, and pure determination to pass laws improving the delivery of optometric care in order to better serve our patients. Meanwhile, in 1977, the United States Supreme Court ruled in Bates versus the Arizona State Bar Association that the prohibition of advertising by lawyers and by inference other professions violated the First Amendment upholding the right of lawyers to advertise their services. This was a hard pill to swallow for the members of the association after years of struggle to prohibit advertising by optometrists. Finally, in April 1982, House Bill 475, allowing the use of diagnostic pharmaceutical agents by optometrists, passed and was signed into law by Governor William Winter. Perhaps the most significant national optometry event during the 1980s was the passage of federal legislation providing approval to reimburse doctors of optometry for covered Medicare services within their state licensure. Thus, Medicare parity with ophthalmology, being paid for the same services and the same amount for the same services that, that, that you were provided. The association continued its effort to expand the scope of practice in keeping with the education and training of doctors of optometry. In 1994, Governor Kirk, Kirk Fordyce signed into law legislation allowing optometrists to treat ocular disease with topical pharmaceutical agents, eye drops. The 38th state to pass such legislation. The Mississippi State Medical Association brought a lawsuit related to this legislation against the state of Mississippi and the Mississippi Board of Optometry. The court dismissed the lawsuit with prejudice. With the advanced curriculum of the schools and colleges of optometry, quality, up-to-date, continuing education, and the growing demand for modern eye and vision care, the scope of practice continued to expand across the nation and in Mississippi. Despite continued opposition by medicine, Governor Haley Barber signed Senate Bill 2682 on March 16, 2005, authorizing the use of oral pharmaceutical agents by mouth by licensed Mississippi optometrists. In 2005, Linda Ross Aldi was appointed the third executive director of the association. With her leadership, the decade leading up to the 100-year anniversary celebration revealed a growing and mature association expanding and accomplishing its mission, which is to enhance, protect, and promote the profession of optometry in Mississippi through advocacy, education, and advancing technology for patient eye care. When I graduated Southern College of Optometry in 1968, the profession in Mississippi was essentially comprised of white males. There was only one woman in active practice, my mother, Dr. Nell Niles, and only one African American, Dr. David White. Now, with approximately 340 optometrists currently in active practice in 72 of Mississippi's 82 counties, the number of women practicing in Mississippi is approaching 50%. And there is ethnic diversity as well, 
more closely reflecting the population of the state. I could go on and on about this book, but y'all have probably heard enough. So in closing, the passage of the Mississippi Optometry Act in 1920 provided the opportunity for the profession to mature and to offer quality, cost-effective, and accessible eye care to its citizens. Since the beginning, the members of the Mississippi Optometric Association have tirelessly, tirelessly worked to improve optometric education, to advocate for the expansion of the scope of practice, and to remain committed to serving the health care needs of the citizens of Mississippi. Dr. Amy Krigler, Startville, said it best as she was completing her second term as the State Association President in 2019. Quote, the profession is in a much better place than it was the last time, 2007, I was president. Her remark sums up the 100 years of Mississippi optometry history. The public and the profession are in a much better place than it was in 1920. So I thank you for the opportunity to share a few tidbits about this book and uh, be glad to take any questions uh, that you might have. Not that I might can answer them all, but I'll certainly take them. Thank you. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. I might actually start it off with a comment and a question from the live stream. Um, the comment is the sad news that they think that those uh, delicious brownies are no longer at Primo's. And so... What? I know, I know. I was just here in the summer, and I've got some. Okay. Good, now, they didn't have good. the purple box. They had a gray box, but they still had them. All right, good. Well, good. I just I heard yesterday that they has, it, they've been sold. That Yeah, that's what they Well, said. maybe that's why I need to talk to the new owner. <laughs> and then the question is, did most uh, towns in Mississippi have optometrists? I... It depends on when you're asking and what, what time period. But as I said... Um, 72 of the 82 counties currently have optometrists practicing in those counties. I know I go deer hunting in Noxaby County, and I go through Macon, uh, and I always look, and there is an office in Macon, and uh, I don't think it's every day, but at least three days a week. But I would say um, um, that, yes, most every, and that's, that's the, I think, the crux of the story of optometry, that Optometrists have become the primary care deliverers of eye care and vision care. Uh, and you have your specialists located in the larger areas where you have larger hospitals because of the surgery and the uh, procedures that they do that require um, you know, more specialized care. But I would say most every town in Mississippi has access, and that makes it better for the citizens that don't have um, the opportunity to travel uh, and so forth. Hey, excellent presentation. You mentioned that your grandfather was a watchmaker, and then he decided to go and become an optometrist. Do you ever make connections between those two professions? Uh, sure. It's a, it's, a, it's a broad connection. But um, as I said, in the early days, in the late 1800s, uh, basically the, the people that did glasses traveled about. Uh, there's a story of a gentleman, where are you, here, that's uh, doing a study about um, about someone that uh, traveled around, and it was like a uh, you know you can think of a guy going around with a horse and buggy, and he stop at a farm and say, uh, "How are you seeing?" Well, I can't see to read anymore. Well, let's go out here and sit down, and we'll we'll flip some lenses, and which one makes you see the best, and so we'll mail them to you. Um, frames have little tiny screws eyeglass frames that hold the temple zone, that hold the lenses in. Probably some of you, you're, you've lost your screw. <laughs> your screw was loose. Um, um, I was at a rotary meeting in Memphis with 350 Rotarians, and the speaker got up there and got ready to give his speech, and his temple, the earpiece, fell off right there. And, of course, all the Rotarians knew 
what I was at at the college, and they said, Billy, Billy, come up here. And said, can you fix this? He's got to have his glasses to see this speech. And uh, I looked around. I said, uh, has anybody got a toothpick? How many toothpicks came out? So I stuck a toothpick down in there and broke it off. That's how you fix a pair of glasses when you don't have your, your stuff with you. But to answer your question, um, because jewelers um, had access to tiny screws and tiny um, screwdrivers to repair, it was just one of the groups of people that began. But as soon as the law passed, for example, in Mississippi, um, I think of those 137 that were originally licensed, within two or three years, there were only 40 or 50 still, still licensed because it changed a lot. So. But uh, it's kind of hard to get that relationship between jewelers. But that's what my grandfather did. Other questions? Yeah, and we have a few more from the live stream. Let me ask those. One, uh, David Gooch asks, where did your parents practice? Uh, they practiced in Kosciuszko. Um, that, as I mentioned, Dad came home from the service and finished up, uh, or not home, but to back to Memphis and finished up his optometry program. My grandfather, I mean my grandmother, my mother, when she finished, she went down to Hattiesburg and worked with my grandfather in his practice. Now, interesting uh, uh, sideline on that, Camp Shelby was the early in the war and the late uh, before the war started was the largest army training post in the country, and they didn't have optometrists in the military at the time, and uh, the military contracted with my grandfather to have those that needed to be able to see the rifle uh, to shoot on the rifle range, and there were a lot of them, the soldiers coming in. And they contracted with him, and he would see his private patients in the morning in Hattiesburg. And then the Army would bring busloads of soldiers in from Camp Shelby, and he would see soldiers in the afternoon until about 10 o'clock at night. So he was very happy when my mother graduated in 43 and was able to come back and help him. But then after my dad graduated, they, they moved to Kosciuszko, and that's where they practiced, and that's where I grew up. One more from online here. Uh, Deirdre Payne asks, what was the oldest optical group in Mississippi and when was Odom's Optical established? Odom's Optical, to my knowledge, uh, I'll answer the second part, um, it, it was there on uh, State Street, if I recall, next to Primo's, actually, back in those days. Uh, if I remember correctly, anybody in here remember where Primo's was on uh, North State Street? And they um, and Odom Optical was there, and Odom Optical was a an optician uh, that supplied um, frames and lenses uh, for those that brought their prescriptions in. I don't know that uh, uh, Mr. Odom was ever an optometrist or not. And what was the other part of the question? Uh, the first part was, what was the oldest optical group in Mississippi? Um, well, the oldest op optometry groups were, were those individuals that were uh, licensed in 1920. Now, if you go back, um, there were people, obviously, um, fitting specs um, as in the late 1800s. So I hope that will answer their question. I appreciate your talk. I've worn glasses since I was 12, and I'm also a historian, so I really enjoyed that. Um, can you go a little bit more, without maybe st stepping on toes, uh, into the the uh, division between opticians, optometrists, and ophthalmologists? ophthalmologists. Sure, be glad to do that. Um, obviously, as as I told you, the profession has progressed from uh, just fit and specs to uh, uh, the education tra cha changing quite a bit. Um, Basically, the battle that we had was over anatomical turf, some people have said. You know, who gets to uh, work on the eye, who gets to work on that. Um, it, so th there was a lot of opposition over the years, and, and, and as the scope of practice of optometry expanded. What's been really interesting as ophthalmology, and, and I use the term eye surgeons, as their um, um, profession has progressed, uh, I can remember when people had cataract surgery in, in the 1950s, 1960s. The, the, it was horrible. 
you had to have your head sandbagged. Uh, they took the entire lens out of your eye. It was a horrible process. And now it's a 10-minute procedure, and you walk out the door, and you're, you're seeing. They do a beautiful job. And so as their profession has changed and uh, matured and grown, then the, the distinction between who is on first and what's on second, and I don't know who's on third, has dissipated. So in, in Mississippi, as well as other parts of the state, Many optometrists and ophthalmologists have practices together so that the optometrist does all the primary work, taking care of most of the people most of the time, we call it, and then the surgeons do what they like to do is do surgery. So it, 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 the distinction has, uh, there is a definite distinction in education, um, the, the training and so forth. So um, it's a difference between primary, primary care providers of eye care and secondary and tertiary care, those that are providing surgery and other procedures. So hopefully that'll answer your question. And by the way, a lot of students that go to optometry school are like you. They start wearing glasses as a kid and they say, this is what I want to do. So that's, that's been a, and I, I will tell you that in, in, um, at Southern College of Optometry, which I'm most familiar with right now, there are, um, it's 70% female. And uh, that's true with the other 22 or 21 schools, 22 in total around the country that most of the, or large percentage of the students now are male. I had three, three females in my class that graduated in 1968, so big change there. Can Somebody asked me, something? why are you taking all the women? I said, because they're smarter. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the primary tools of optometry and how they've changed over the years? Uh, well, I would say this, the exam chair that you're sitting in probably hasn't changed a whole lot since, uh, uh, since the old days. Uh, uh, obviously, exam chairs have changed, but the instruments that we use uh, are just the, the technology, uh, the science and technology that's, that's uh, changed so much um, in, in an eye exam. Uh, many uh, practices... Um, you, a lot of the tests are already run before the doctor ever sees you because there's, the, the technology is so advanced. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, I know at, at Southern College of Optometry over the years, we were just continually upgrading uh, the different uh, auto, auto refractors. Instead of the doctor having to sit there and ask you which is better, one or two, you put your chin in and, and, and uh, it, it records... Uh, what your prescription needs to be. Then they may refine it by asking you which is better, one or two. <laughs> but uh, technology has changed tremendously over the years. I'm going to go with Jennifer here. I've worn glasses all my life, and I've always wondered, how in the world could you fit glasses to a child? The child could not respond Great. One or two. All right. Fifteen the, months. And and place. what do you think about someone uh, that uh, can't talk, can't hear? Um, actually, the when the question actually is asked one or two, that is a objective a measurement. We're trying to refine. Uh, the doctor has already determined what your refraction needs are, what the power needs to be through a subjective method. Uh, one of the instruments that we use is a retinoscope, and you can neutralize the power of the eye with that scope uh, by putting lenses in front. And you can, you, so you already know, the doctor already knows what, pretty much what, 99% what you're going to need, but then it's refined by asking one or two. So uh, a child, uh, if you can get, say, a, an infant, to at least look at a certain distance and usually incorporate the mama to uh, get down and, and get their attention. So you can, with certain instruments, you can determine what the power of the eye should be. Like zero, no power is needed, which is normal, or they're nearsighted or farsighted or have astigmatism or uh, some other error that might be done. So uh, that, that old man that asked that question, which is better, one or two, uh, he actually uh, the doctor really didn't need to know that. Does that help? <laughs> yep. So one of the instruments that's used is already determined what power you pretty much need. That's when they shine the light in your eye. 
And we got plenty of time, don't we, Chris? In reality, people are come in off the street and are trained a few weeks, and they're the one that fits your glasses. Come in the in old day, in, in in nineteen twenty, no, now that now is uh, four years of pre-optometry of college of uh, and getting a, a bachelor's degree, and then attending four years of optometry school, so that's eight years. And then about a third, most of the optometry schools in the country offer um, another year of advanced training and do a residency. So uh, it's any, most, most, I'd say a third of the graduates of optometry school uh, attend and do a residency. But uh, the other two thirds, four years of college minimum and a degree, and then four years of optometry school. So it'd be eight years, basically. So we have one more question from the live stream. Everybody has a question right now, we'll ask it. Uh, Sarah Campbell asks, what do you predict will be the most important changes in optometric care in the coming decades? Well, <laughs> The, the issue today is the, it's technology, instrumentation, what's available. Um, there are pretty much the primary care procedures that optometrists around the country uh, can do are pretty well established. Mississippi may have a, a few of those uh, that need to be improved, but as technology changes, uh, in the future, just as any any profession and any situation, as technology changes, then uh, if those become primary care procedures, if those are things that that optometrists are trained and can do, and in their curriculum in optometry school, or go back and and take extra work, then those procedures would be added. Um, I'm I'm so old now; uh, it's hard for me to figure out. Uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to contact somebody on the phone and, and ask you the question. So, uh, but technology is as it changes, uh, then the profession would would uh, change accordingly. How is telehealth? I'm sorry. Uh, how is telehealth? Uh, affecting well, you know, uh, that is something that's probably going to impact the next generation of people much more so than it will me. I'm not going to say you all because I, I don't want to speak for you all. But there are few, well, in 1945 when I was born, there were 150 million people in the United States. Today, there are 330 million people in the United States. So, as you know, how many, raise your hand if you've seen a nurse practitioner in, in the doctor's office. Okay. So, 20 years ago, nobody heard of a nurse practitioner. I've seen my nurse practitioner in Memphis, and she's wonderful. And that's because there are not enough medical doctors. So telemedicine is already growing by leaps and bounds. Now, um, I don't know with optometry, uh, there'll be some things, particularly um, if a child has an infection and could call in and, and need a medication for the infection, just like you would do your primary care physician about a cold or whatever. So there would be telemedicine in that regard, but I'm not so sure about, well, I do know that there are instruments, again, it goes back to instrumentation, that uh, uh, I, I read a few years ago where you hold the phone up in front of you and they, they uh, refract you and determine what the power that you need. So um, that, that could change a lot. One of the things that fascinated me so much when I first started hanging out with you optometry guys were the number of diseases you could detect in a dilated eye exam, which I think the phone thing misses uh, that part of the health. So talk a little bit about the different things. Right. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, diabetes um, and glaucoma are two of the, uh, two of the diseases that... Uh, optometry again at the top of the bad list and that was lead, leading the nation in blindness. I'm, I don't know the statistics now but at that time 
And there's so many, so many things that when we look inside your eye uh, with an ophthalmoscope, um, you can see better when you can dilate the pupil and make the pupil bigger so you can see more. Obviously, instead of a tiny hole, you're looking through a big hole. And there are all sorts of disease, kidney disease, um, um, di as we mentioned, diabetes, uh, hypertension. There's so many diseases that uh, the optometrist in, a, in just the routine eye exam would pick up by looking in your eye and then make the appropriate referral to the appropriate doctor. And that's done uh, routinely almost every day. Dr. Out here practices in Kosciuszko where I did, and <clears throat> well, I just had a steady stream of my patients when I practiced going to their local doctor um, and, and many, many different... Uh, uh, I, th I had a lady that came in one time and after looking in her eye, I thought, you know, she's, she's got a bad thyroid. She needs a, she has, she has a problem. Let's get her to her, uh, her, uh, uh, her medical doctor to treat her, uh, for hyperthyroidism. So there's all kinds of things that you can see inside the eye. So when optometrists were allowed to dilate the eye, we could do a much back in whatever year now, Linda, um, in the 80. To 80, 1980, you could see in the eye better because you could dilate it. And also, prior to that time, checking for glaucoma, checking the pressure in the eye is very difficult because if you've ever touched your cornea, you know, or had something, got an abrasion, it hurts. And so if we could numb the cornea and then do the pressure test, uh, it made a much better accurate uh, 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 test. So, yes, by dilating the eye, you can see a lot of things uh, that are going on that show up in the eye as a, as a result of, of other diseases. Nowadays, when you go to the eye doctor, you get lenses from different companies, or sorry, lenses, uh, frames from different companies. I wonder back in the earlier days of the profession if the doctor also made the frames or how that works. Then the lenses came from the doctor or whomever, but I'm curious about the frames. Um, optical companies, uh, optical supply houses, if you will, um, it, it's, and it, all kinds of frames were made in, in the United States, but it's just like everything else that's, that we get now, it migrated overseas. And uh, there, there are a few maybe current uh, U.S. optical made or frames and lens, frames made, but a lot of the frames come from overseas now, most of them, and, and from fewer and fewer companies because they combine and and uh, conglomerates. Um, but in the old days, a lot of people ordered their frames from an optical laboratory. I mentioned I worked for one in in Jackson when I was in college, and we had the frames there. Uh, we, the prescription would come from the doctor's office. We would go through the laboratory and, and, uh, and grind those lenses, prepare them, cut them out the right shape of the frame because every frame is different shape, and then put them in the frames and mail them to the doctor. Um, you know, almost all, uh, anybody that's, by the way, is an optician, ophthalmology, optometry, went to that. Now, a lot of doctors have their own laboratory in their in their office, so they can uh, do some of that work in their own laboratory. But um, contact lenses, um, when they came out, and then especially with soft lenses, I mean, so many more people could wear contact lenses, and so. But people all still need a pair if they couldn't see, like you know you're talking about. They needed their glasses at night when they took the contact off. But the uh, point I want to make is that uh, over the years, frames have become such a fashion statement that more and more people are wearing their glasses because, hey, I've got the right uh, color, the right shape, or the, you know, uh, the right company name. Uh, you know, just like, uh, you know, you wear your, your uh, sports clothes, you either get Adidas or, or you get, uh, they don't even make Wilson sports clothes anymore. I used to do that when I was a kid, but you, you have to get the big name stuff. So, Frames are a fashion statement, and I think that's probably where you were headed with that. Any other questions? Yep. Good.
I know there's some charities that collect used glasses and then send them to different countries. How do they fit those on children or people there? Right. Great question. Um, I was very involved in that at Southern College of Optometry. There's a student organization. Used to, Lions Clubs did a lot of that. They may not as much as they do today uh, because fewer and fewer people join civic organizations like in years gone by. But at SCO, the Southern College of Optometry, uh, there's an organization of students, as well as the other optometry school, called SFOSH, Student Volunteers and Optometric Services to Humanity. And students would go to Central America, uh, Caribbean, and different areas, uh, and go to rural areas and provide eye exams and eye care, treating a lot of kids uh, that are, have eye infections and just a, a whole wide variety of problems. And these students collect old frames and lenses from all over the country, uh, at all the other schools. Uh, like in Memphis, they've got Lions Clubs and other churches and organizations sending uh, frames, old frames and lenses when they discard them. For example, at, at my wife and uh, our church in Memphis, uh, Emanuel Methodist Church, we have a group that that's all they do. They just collect glasses and they actually neutralize the power. And this gets what they neutralize the power and they catalog them in powers so that uh, when these groups go to these um, underprivileged countries, they're able to uh, have a whole variety of lenses already in frames. And they're cataloged, so they know, you know, they know where the power is. And so they they'll do an eye exam, and they'll say, okay, they need a, a power X Y Z, and they walk over and they pick it out. And so these people are thrilled if they're real nearsighted, real farsighted, or can't see to read up close. They're thrilled. They're not going to argue about do they have a, a name brand frame. You know, they they're just glad to get get. So this is a a big operation uh, and has been for. Uh, gosh, I almost say in the 70s, students were going. And there are other organizations that, that uh, do that. A lot of optometrists around the country have their own group. Instead of student volunteers and optometric uh, services humanity, it's um, not student volunteers, but Bosch, just without the S. They're doctors that get together, and they, they get equipment shipped to some of these countries uh, and so they'll have the kind of equipment they need and and, uh, and there are ophthalmology groups that uh, literally fly around the world doing cataract surgery uh, in, in, in poor nations so uh, and, and other surgeries too so there's a lot of that that um, that takes place so thank you for that question we have time for one last quick question from the um, live stream, and uh, that is, what was the f part of your research for the book? What was your favorite part of the research for the book? Well, I have to admit that uh, the the fun chapter for me was writing the history of my family and talking about all the uh, experiences. There's a lot more in the book, and I actually tried to put a lot more in the book that I experienced, but the editor had me leave some of that out, I must admit. But uh, I did... Uh, the, it was really fun to um, uh, get the state board records. In fact, uh, the lady that, uh, uh, Beverly Limbaugh, that uh, is the state board secretary, a staff person, I called her and asked her, uh, told her I was writing this book, and I said, could I get some records? Could I come to Jackson and, and sit and review these records? She said, I'll do better than that. I'll bring them up to Batesville. My parents live in Batesville. I'll bring them up to Batesville, and you can come and get them. And uh, I said, these are state records. She said, I know who you are. So, uh, so getting those kind of records and going through was, uh, it was, it was a real pleasure. Um, I know we're up for time. So thank you all for being here. It's been a wonderful experience for me. And I, I hope you got a little uh, more broad view of Mississippi history. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you have not been to a History's Lunch program and you have not been to the museums, uh, your admission to the museums is free if you'd like to stick your head in. So take a look at that uh, while you're here. Come back next week to hear Mr. Frank Figures talking about the history of the Stringer Grand Lodge. 
uh, there are copies of the book. I think we don't have any for sale today, but we can we can take an order from you for one. Uh, thank you all for being here. Help me thank Dr. Billy Cochran for this fabulous program one more time.